What's up, penguins and friends from all over the world? Good morning to you. Man, I got a, I got a lot of really cool things just to chat with you about. I uh, wanted to catch you up on last night. Uh, Flying Penguins men's group had three new fellas and just an amazing time. But also, I wanted to just give you a little bit of insight on some of the things that I just I love to do uh, with my family and, and some ways that I just instill faith uh, within my own family. So I, I think my wife had talked to me about this, and, and probably we heard about this from, from some friends. But when, when my kids, so I've got four kiddos, and when my kids turned 15 years old, uh, I buy them a Bible. And so my, uh, my oldest right now is almost 18 and I did this for him and it was really, really pretty cool. And then my second son, uh, just turned 15 on Saturday. Woohoo! And so I bought this Bible and it is a, one of these big old honking, massive, thick Bibles, right? But this is the ESV study Bible and this is what I give to them on their 16th birthday. And what I do is I do a one-year Bible reading plan, and I go through every single page of this Bible, and I mark it, and I put just little words of encouragement in it for them, um, and things that are specific to them that it's very personalized, and so I'll underline things that I want them to pay attention to, and I'll mark notes on there. Sometimes it's just being silly, you know. I mean, and I know some people laugh, but you know, some of the names in the Bible are are kind of funny, and so I'll I'll make little comments in the section in the in the sides and and kind of laugh, and I and I think that's great because. I want I want him to connect not just with me but I also want him to connect with the father. And so my my goal for this is that I want to encourage all of my kids to read the word of God and not just read it a bit here and there but cover to cover. And this is something I I've I've done gosh this is probably my 7th or 8th time through the through the entire Bible. And if you've never done it, man, I would encourage you to do it because it is phenomenal. And and I'll tell you the the plan that I love the best. You know, I started out going, you know, from cover to cover, uh, just an order of the pages. And I've switched over the last couple of times now to the chronological Bible. And, and I love that much better because the Bible's a story. It's history. It's a story. It's, it's so rich, but I think it definitely helps you understand, especially when you get into like first and second Kings and Chronicles. That gets tough, man. That's usually the, the, the dry zone for, for reading through the whole thing. And when, when you see it together in the chronological order, it brings, you know, kings and chronicles together so that you begin to see, oh, wow, this is just two different views of the same information. And you don't feel like, oh, it's so repetitive, right? So it's helpful. But anyway, I just wanted to, to just to share that with you guys because that's something that, that, I've, I've done and we do as a family that I think is it's easy to do. And number one, it's awesome for you all as, as moms or dads. It's phenomenal for you all to read all the way through the word. If you haven't done it, I could not encourage you more to do that uh, because it just gives you a better breadth of understanding of the Father. And then it instills that into your kids that, wow, my, my parents, number one, love me enough to dedicate an entire year to just them and doing this. And it it's an amazing gift when you hand this to them than just going to buy a Bible and just slapping it on their, you know, on their desk or something. Uh, this is a demonstration of your commitment not only to God the Father, but your love and commitment and dedication to them as as a as a son or a daughter. And the intent is that it encourages them to dive deep into the Bible. So I just just wanted to share that with you. Uh, it's something I love doing, and and uh, I think it's really really cool to do. All right, the next piece, uh, flying penguins, man. We had our Monday night meeting, 
And we had three new guys come that was just awesome. And it was amazing because uh, one of the guys, he, he approached me right before we met. He's like, hey, I've got a new guy coming that I've never met before. He's like, my wife invited him. And what I love is, is this guy has been coming to Penguins, you know, uh, for a couple of months now. And his wife is like almost pushing him out the door, he says, to come to, to the meeting. said, because she said, you're, you've changed since you started. And I love, I love hearing those, those conversations and, and that testimony, man, because if your wife is, is pushing you out the door and not because she's mad at you, but is, is pushing you out the door because she's seeing a difference. That's real change, right? Because our, our kids and our wives see the best and the worst of us oftentimes. And, I love those testimonies, and it's not because we've got some weird penguin sauce that we, you know, make you drink or whatever. It's because it's the presence of God, and it's because we want to foster an environment where it's okay to fail, right? And it's okay to practice a lot of these things that we look at, even words of knowledge or healing or prophecy, whatever that may be. We have to be able to practice in a safe environment where we can fail, guys. Because how on earth do you learn and understand that, hey, this is the Holy Spirit speaking to me. This is the voice of the Father. Or this is just bad pizza or my own my own thoughts. How can we test that? Unless we're in an environment where we can do that and where it's okay to fail, right? Because Unfortunately, a lot of environments, man, if you don't get it right, do you are beaten, chastised, and thrown out, right? Because people are just waiting for somebody to mess up and they pounce on them. And so what, what we've really tried to foster is an environment that it's okay to fail. And in fact, I encourage failure. I know that's weird to say, but I tell you know the fellows that come, I say, guys, if if you're not taking risks and if you're not failing, you're not actually stepping out in faith. And so I think for a lot of fellas, it's it's a, and I know for myself, I, I mean, I created this because this is what I wanted, right? It's an environment I wanted to have. And it's also the environment that I, I see and sense with my relationship with the Father. And so having that ability to be able to be real and to come in and say, man, I got in a fight with my wife or, you know what, guys, I'm having a crap week and I I just, I want to quit. We've got to have places where we can come and do that and and not have everybody pounce on you like, oh, well, the word of God says, you know, stand strong. You know what? I I, I love the intention behind that, but sometimes, man, don't don't slap me in the face with a Bible verse that you just yanked out and just, you know, it's like whack. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't want that. Sometimes I just want to hear, you know, that sucks, man. I'm sorry. And it's like, hey, thanks. You know, we need brothers and sisters, but we need brothers especially that can just walk with us side by side and just say, you know what? Yeah, life sucks right now for you. I'm sorry, dude. Let's come on, let's just walk through this together. Because there are times where life is going to just suck. <laughs> sorry, I know we're not supposed to say that as as Christians, right? <laughs> that, that life sometimes sucks, and it does. There are times where you're getting hammered from every side and and you feel like Everything falls apart, right? Your car breaks down, your dog gets sick, he craps on the floor, you know, whatever. Your wife is mad at you, your kids aren't doing what you want them to do. And it's like everything is like falling apart or caving in sometimes. And I just want to say if that's where you are, it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to be super strong and just tough it out. Sometimes it's okay to just say, man, life sucks for me right now. And I just, I need some help. You know, that's, that's the body of Christ where we can come in and say that and not feel ostracized or ridiculed or like, hey, take three verses and memorize these three verses and you'll be better in the morning. Yay! You know, because that's what we tend to do. And it's, it's crap to be quite honest. Now, 
keep in mind, I am not saying that the Word of God isn't powerful and effective. What I am saying is that this the body has to be a relational body to one another, not chastising. We build one another up, and sometimes I have to walk through fire with you, or you have to walk through fire with me to really build trust and relationship. Because when the fire comes, when when the turmoil comes, that's when we really see who the real friends are, not just our news and weather friends that I call them, you know, where you get together and you just talk news and weather, or you you talk Christianese, right? Man, I, I, that drives me nuts half the time. It's so shallow half the time. And it doesn't really impact me or change me. So that's the environment that that we have with penguins and that we really push for and go after. And if and if you've ever come and for the fellows that have come, they'll hear me say this all the time that guys, this is what we're after. This is this is the environment we want to be in. And our focus is on we want to encounter the presence of God powerfully, powerfully, powerfully encounter the presence of God so that He transforms us. It's not our job to transform each other. Our job is to encourage one another, walk with one another, and then encourage each other into a deeper relationship with the Father. And that does come through community with each other. But the focus is always driving to the Father through the blood of Christ, through the being the new creation. And so I say all that because, you know, with these these three fellows that come, that came last night, uh, you know, one of them, nobody knew, right? And he shows up and what's awesome, and I love this group of fellows that we've got because, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma and I don't, I don't know very much Spanish. I took Spanish in high school and it didn't stick very well for me. But about half of these guys that come are Spanish speakers and they're bilingual and it's awesome. And thank the Lord, because this brother that came, didn't he didn't speak hardly any English. Now, he understood English pretty well, I would say, but couldn't speak English at all, hardly. And so it was amazing, just the, 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 the whole thing last night, we had, it was bilingual the entire night, because either they were speaking to this brother in Spanish, or they were translating, so I could understand, and some of the other guys, and, and funny, I was in the minority because I didn't know Spanish, uh, which, and I love that. That's the body of Christ. Um, but this brother comes and, you know, we worship and one of the, one of the brothers has a word of knowledge for him and just says, Hey, can we pray for you? And the way we do prayer at Penguins is we throw some dude in the middle of, of, of the room and we just set, set him down on a chair and then everybody who wants to, and you don't have to, get, we gather around, we just lay hands on and we just ask the Father to show us what he wants to say about this individual. And then, you know, I always encourage the brothers to say, so you just share what you see or you hear, see in your imagination or hear in your mind or just the impression that you feel. And... And then if you're unsure about it, always ask the Father, right? So I love this. This is Gil Hodges, the, the three plumb lines, right? At the end, ask the Father, number one, if He wants you to share, and then how you should share it. Because sometimes things that you see or hear are not to be shared. And if we share those, they can be damaging to other, other folks or the body. It may just be for you to understand it. Or the Father says, I showed you this, and I want you to speak the opposite in there. So we always speak life. And so it was amazing just working with this with this brother. And what was what was really cool is, I mean, after we prayed over him, and I mean, just you could tell the Lord just blessed him and rocked him. And we he kept saying he was encountering Jesus, but he said, Something's holding me back. And one of the brothers said, I just, I feel there's witchcraft or something going on in the, in the family line. And so we asked, asked the brothers that, Hey, has, did anyone in your family, you know, uh, practice witchcraft? He said, yeah, you know, it was his dad and his dad had been murdered when he was 11. I mean, just, just awful stuff. But anyway, um, as soon as he said that, I see this contract with blood. And I said, it's a blood contract. There was a contract. And he said, yes. My father made a contract of death and blood. And so 
that's what was kind of haunting him. And I saw, I kept seeing these shadow figures with him. And I asked him, I said, so tell me about these shadow figures that you see out of the corner of your eye. And he said, yes. He said, I, they're all they're watching me. And so we were picking up, obviously, that there was some occult activity generationally going on. And so, you know what, the thing is with any of that stuff, it sounds scary, but it's not because the blood of Christ overcomes. And so we just broke the, the contracts in, in, the, in the name and the blood of Christ and we renounced it. We had him renounce it for his entire family and he just he felt this weight start to come off. And then it was crazy. He said, okay, I need to, I need to confess something that I've never shared. It's, it's a secret. And he goes on to confess this thing that he's never shared with anybody. And it was it was deep and it was very personal. And in fact, some of it he was continuing in a in a relationship that wasn't healthy for him. And so he's asking now, he said, I so I've confessed this. Uh, but is this sin? And is it okay for me to continue in this? And so we just really walked through it with him and loved on him. And and the ultimate answer was, yeah, you can't continue to walk in the light of Christ and grow deep in relationship and continue walking in this in this sin. And it was it was blatant sin. Uh, but I love it because he was asking the question. And so he didn't walk out feeling condemned, but it was like, hey, you've got a choice. This this behavior is destructive to not only you, but to others as well. And it's not healthy for you. And it it brings condemnation, guilt, and shame that then removes you from the Father. Not the Father removing from Him. It causes Him to be feel guilty and then he doesn't want to be in the presence of God because he feels ashamed, right? And that's what sin does. When we walk in sin, it causes us to forget who we are, number one. We believe the lie that the enemy wants us to believe, and, and we forget who we are as, as a son or a daughter of the king, holy, righteous, and pure, and we begin to believe the lie that God doesn't like us, he doesn't love us, he doesn't want to be with us. And even if it's something that happened to you, right, if you were abused or whatever, oftentimes that makes you feel unworthy. And then you begin to believe the lie that, oh, God really doesn't care for me. He doesn't love me. And so that's why we, we, we can't walk in sin, right? And we can't walk in those behaviors because it, it opens those doors that, that allow us to believe lies. Now, your nature, if you are, if you are in Christ, your nature is the nature of Christ, Right, and he says that all those things are dead, gone, and buried. Right, that's the symbolism of baptism: is that our old self has died with Christ, been co-crucified, and now we have been raised to life in Jesus as a new creation. And so that's what we we break that stuff off. And part of that is, man, I do have to separate from old patterns of life, old old sin nature. It'll come back and try to convince you that, oh, it's still there. It's still there. You're still really this person. And that's the lie of it. And so we break that off and we encourage one another in their identity and say, actually, you're no longer a slave to it. You don't have to obey it, but you can you can come back under that law of sin and death if you choose to. You're not required to. You're not obligated to. And it doesn't have power over you unless you give it power. And so that's really what we encourage one another with. And so another brother that we prayed for, and it was awesome, his first time as well, and he had just been ridiculed. And I saw in in him, there was just female figures that were just nagging him and just hammering him, questioning everything he did. And he was just being a boy, you know, and especially as a young man, he was just being a knucklehead boy. And I've got three of them, and I can tell you, boys are knuckleheads half the time, especially when they're young. And and I always I laugh, and I told him this last night. I said, "Here's the deal." I said, "My dad always told me this, and this is what I teach my my kids as well." I said, "Son, there are better ways to do dumb things." <laughs> and when you think about it. Half the time, you're just trying to keep boys alive as they're, when they're young. Uh, but there are. There are better ways to do dumb things. And, and it's teaching kids to think through 
certain things, and hopefully they will decide to not do it, or if they end up deciding to do it, there's safer ways to do it and better ways to do it. So anyway, what was amazing with this guy was uh, when he encountered Jesus, it took him back into a, a school situation where he was just being a boy, you know, being being silly, and you know he's getting ridiculed in the um, in the in the classroom, and all of a sudden Jesus is right there with him, and Jesus is goofing around and playing with him, and actually, and I, as I'm watching this, and I'm kind of sharing this with him, it's like. Jesus is actually instigating some of this with you. just And it's good, clean fun. And he's out somewhere else and he's out of the classroom. So he's not disrupting too much. But it was this, for him, it was acceptance of, I made you the way I made you. And I love your, just the energy that you have. And I love the way you think. And this is what Jesus was just communicating to him through his actions and it was healing with him. And so what was fun was as he just continued in this, he felt peace and he felt approval and acceptance. And now what happens with this is the more that you feel that approval and acceptance, the more now that you can receive correction and counsel and wisdom. But if you don't have relationship to do that, you don't typically receive counsel and and wisdom. You reject it. And so Jesus is always, always bringing us up into Him. He is always bringing us further into approval. Even though we've got it fully, we don't always believe it. So Jesus was just loving on Him and goofing around with Him. And I and I do see this as well, and, and it offends some people, and that's okay. But I often see it, and this is what He saw as well, that cracks me up. He's like, Jesus just has this goofy grin on His face, and He's silly, just absolutely silly. And that's what I think blew this guy's mind because he'd always been chastised for being silly. And yet here's Jesus being sillier than him and actually instinct. Come on. Hey, come do this. Hey, check this out. Hey, try this. Right? That's my God. That's the Father. He is creative. He is joyful and he's playful. And I think too many of us forget to play with God. And we forget that he has the biggest laugh in the universe. Think of this. When the father laughs, and I mean belly laughs, the galaxies vibrate. Galaxies reverberate with his laughter. And it's like just this energizing, this energy. You know, when somebody comes in and it's just that authentic belly laughter it, it's contagious. It spreads through the room and everybody either starts laughing or or they start just feeling joy. And so it was amazing because then the, the third guy, uh, it, was, it was interesting. I, I, I know this guy pretty well. And I asked him, I said, hey, and this is his first time. He's not really been in this kind of an environment before. And I said, hey, what do you, what do you think? You know, or what's what's going on? He's like, wow. I said, a couple of the things that you guys talked about, I saw in my imagination. And, you know, and he was starting to encounter the Father as well. And so I asked him, I said, hey, did any of this, was any of this confirming to you seeing these first two guys? He says, actually, I feel like you guys were talking to me. He said, so many of what you guys were saying and what they were saying was me. And I love that because this is when people realize you're not alone. You're not alone. And when you get into an environment where where men and women are absolutely real, you realize, oh my gosh, they've got the same problems that I do. They struggle with the same doubts and fears that I do. I'm not alone. And all of a sudden, he just opens right up. And I'm like, come on, dude, let's get in the middle. And you've got all of a sudden these brothers uh, laying hands on you and praying for you and walking through this. And what was amazing with him was he saw God the Father as a lion. And I immediately saw uh, the lion from um, from Narnia, right? So Aslan the lion. And 
And as and I asked him about the lion, and he said it's it's like Aslan. And I said yes, Narnia, and I was like that's what I saw as well. And so it's just this confirming. But here's the coolest thing with it, right? As as this big massive lion, just huge lion, is walking towards him, right? He's like, I said, well, what do you want to do? And he's describing what's happening. He's like, well, part of me wants to run away, and he said, but then part of me like is is just drawn to him, and that's this this constant peace when we come into the presence of God sometimes there's fear but what the father does is what he's doing is he's calling out sometimes fear that is not our identity and that's the attachments the junk and the lies that we believe that is responding to that is responding to the presence of God but the coolest thing is and he couldn't look him in the eyes I always encourage people to look Jesus or the lion in the eyes directly, because that's the window into the heart and the soul. And the moment you look into Jesus's eyes, man, you are gone. You are lost in love, and you see galaxies in the universe. It's unbelievable. But he couldn't do it yet. And part of the reason is because there was too much unworthiness that he felt, and guilt, and shame, and he couldn't look in there. And it's like, that's okay. Don't worry about it. And so what does God do? Coming in as the lion, and this, and he was seeing himself as a little boy, and the lion just literally comes up beside him and just kind of just leans over onto him. And, and we see this picture with this guy, and he's just grabbing onto the mane of the lion. They're not saying anything. They're not doing anything. He's just holding on to him, and that's it. There wasn't anything that was said, and he felt strength. And as we just walk through this with him, he was able to take the hurts and the pain and the abuse that he had, had felt and always feeling like he had to be strong, but he wasn't strong. He knew he wasn't strong. And he could just hold on to the mane of this lion. Mm. God, I just... Sorry. Sometimes when... When I see these things, when we're praying for guys, I see it and I feel it because that's part of the joys of being a feeler is I often feel their emotion and I see this. And so I feel the pain, but then I see, I see the release and I watch this little boy scared and hurt and afraid. And as he holds on this line, it was like, all of those emotions just get poured into the lion. And on the lion, it's like the father just absorbs it and takes it and doesn't even bat an eye. And it's like you could just see the, the release and you could just see this little boy just nuzzle his head into the lion. And that's the father. <laughs> that's the father, guys. And... And I love it. I absolutely love it. This is why I do what I do. I love it. Because for the first time, this guy felt accepted. He felt loved. He felt like God was there for him. And this kid's been a Christian his whole life. And it was the beginning of the process. It wasn't this profound lightning and thunder it was so gentle and so kind, and it wasn't overbearing. It wasn't pushing to, to get rid of everything. It wasn't pushing to, to break it all off now. It was simply the Father saying, I am here, and I love you, and I want you just to hold on to me tight and just hug me and don't let go. And that was the beauty of it. And so when we kind of just talking to, to this guy a little bit afterwards and just helping him understand what was happening. I said, listen, this is the relationship. The Father wants relationship with you. He doesn't he, really, and I know this sounds weird, he's not after success of the ministry. He's not after total deliverance. Yes, those, those are results of the relationship. It's not the goal. The, the reality is is the Father wants relationship with you, deep, intimate relationship into His heart and into your heart. And as a result of that, the lies get broken. We get delivered. We are more free. We understand and we believe our identity more and more. 
but it's the relationship and the intimacy with the Father. And so, man, I just, I, I can't get enough of this. And I see this over and over and over, not just with penguins, guys. I see this throughout the body. And that's why I love like the fringe and and Kingdom Talks and Truth Seeker and Gil Hodges and, and all these guys, because this is the heart of what I'm seeing. And this is the body of Christ. We are shifting. We're moving from guilt and condemnation and sin focus to relationship focus and identity in Christ focused, which the results are a, a life that looks and behaves far more like Christ, but the result is true freedom, not just behavior modification. So thanks for, for bearing with me. And man, yeah, I get emotional and that's okay uh, because when you see these things, when you see the Father, it's hard not to get emotional. And I love it. I, I'll never apologize for that. And if you're with me long, you're probably going to see me just sob at times and weep because that's what the Father also does. And that's the beauty of the Father. And that is healing. And so there are times, and what we encourage Him to do is just, I want you to just hang on to His mane. Don't say a word. Just spend time. And so I want to encourage you guys that you don't have to have these massive revelations and these deep conversations. Sometimes it's okay just to hang on to His mane and squeeze it tight and just do nothing and rest in Him. And that is so important to do that. So have an amazing, amazing week and hang out with the Father. And just spend time with Him and just love on Him and just be with Him. Right? So have an awesome time. Thank you for listening and I can't wait to talk to you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. 